Hi everyone, my name is Felix and I work on Autonomous Assembly at Omron Sinic X. In this talk, I will explain what makes the assembly problem difficult, talk about our team's experience and the challenge, and give some pointers on designing a robot system. Then I'll explain some standard approaches to coding assembly processes, their ups and their downs, and some notes about implementing them in Move It and ROS. The source code we use at the last challenge is released. So if you want an example, please have a look at it down here. Now, the World Robot Assembly Challenge is a robot competition hosted by the Japanese government. Teams let the robot system assemble the motor drive unit on the right with the parts and the tray in here. There are also some surprise configurations that you need to respond to. And what makes this so difficult is that for one, the task is very long and there are many complex manipulations involved. The three videos at the bottom show a human demonstration and that should make clear how difficult the problem is. You see that there's very small parts, deformable parts, tight tolerances. Even small mistakes can make the robot lock up. Now, traditionally the industry would solve this by making special jigs for all of the parts. So their position is known precisely and all of the steps can be taught by hand. But that is so expensive and it also doesn't get us into the future or at least not the kind of future I think that we all want for robots. To give you an idea of the cost of this, the cost of just these jigs in robot motion, this integration can be up to 70% of the whole cost of the robot system. And that adds up for maintenance. So to reduce this cost, we have this competition in which we have to deal with a less structured environment with much more uncertainty, like the tray with the parts that can roll around. Next, I'll explain how we approach this. In principle, we believe that this can be solved with a two-arm robot. In 2018, we had three arms because one of the grippers had a custom prototype on it and we needed two grippers to hold stuff. And in 2019, we had two small robot arms, but the workspace was too small and it was all too crowded. And this year we're going for the two robot arms on the left with the open workspace arrangement that you see there. The competition didn't happen yet, so we can't give everything away, but this much is fine, we're not scared. Still have some aces up our sleeves. On the next slide, there's a lot of stuff, but that's mostly for reference. The main takeaway here is that we're connecting a lot of things together, which is why ROS helps us a lot, and that we're using only one PC because it's simpler. There are good reasons why you may need multiple machines, mainly when you need high-speed robot control, for example, or you need to offload perception modules. But if you can avoid that, you'll have a much better time. A common for everyone who starts making these systems is always have a visualization debug display up and running. It will help you. Trust me. I also won't say much about this slide, except to say that you always have to strike a balance between prototyping speed and clean code. So don't feel bad about cutting corners and fixing things later sometimes. And if you can, use Docker to maintain a common environment in your team for development. It saves a lot of time, big recommendation. Our 2018 repository also has some example scripts for that. And talking about the team, I do wanna give those a shout out especially the students who are graduating before the competition, they won't get to have the full experience, which is very sad. So how do people normally program these assembly and manipulation tasks? My impression is that there's a sliding scale of complexity, but for industry and application, there are a few main approaches that you can group together. The first is the most classic teaching and playback sort of approach, either by a teach pendant or by manual coding. These instructions are either a global coordinate or in fixed calibrated reference frames like jigs or work tables. But they need to be recalibrated when something in the system changes and they're expensive to set up and maintain. And this is usually the most common method when using jigs, but it's not very flexible. The second method, which I'll call object-centered description, is the more modern version where dynamically generated objects in the scene affect the plan. For example, the size of a picked box or the angle of a part that you grasp will affect the trajectory. Usually this is used in pick and play systems, but obviously the complexity can differ. Moving a box, for example, is much easier than grasping and then positioning a pin or even a frying pan. But we do see this type of task description in real applications. The third method is, as far as I can tell, at the moment mostly used in research and prototyping. It uses multi-step planning to evaluate, for example, if a grasp pose will cause issues further down the line when you want to place it or if a regrasp will be needed. I think that this approach is not very widespread for mainly two reasons. 
One is that it's difficult to run in real time, and the other is that it's not very easy to set up. Robots are already complicated enough, and people don't want to do unnecessary work. Afterwards, outside of these three methods, systems may still use additional techniques, like impedance or force control to insert a peg, or visual serving to find a hole or a target. But those generally sit on top or outside of these parameterization methods. So let's go through these one by one in a bit more detail. As mentioned before, using fixed poses to define the trajectories is safe and easy. It's just not very flexible. But this can be the best solution if your environment is controlled or you don't have many problems to solve. The best way to do this and move it is to use the SRDF to define your name poses, your join poses, and the URDF to make your frames and your reference frames visible and accessible in Arbis. Definitely do that instead of hiding the joint angles somewhere in your script as an array. It's bad. With the second way to describe a task, using objects and key points on them, your code can become a lot more readable and portable. In my opinion, this is actually the sweet spot for implementing and reusing routines at the moment without too much overhead. The main thing you need to take care of is how you define your frames, and a central movie feature that you need to know about to use this effectively as subframes, which I'll explain next. Subframes are points of interest on an object. For example, the tip of a screwdriver or the head of a screw. On Move It Master and Noetic, or if you compile from source on Melodic, collision objects have subframes that allow you to write real nice and intuitive code like move screwdriver tip above screw head. And that will work with collision objects. The main recommendation I have for you when you use this is to set a convention for your frames. So you don't have to think while writing code. For example, Pointing the x-axis into holes and the x-axis away from tips of objects that need to go into holes. If you do that, then you don't have to rotate in your head all the time, and that's quite nice. Also, if you want to be a hero, review that PR at the bottom of the slide, because those subframes are going to be even easier to use as soon as that passes, and it just needs a few more reviews. I'm sure you can already imagine why this feature is useful, but let me show you another example that should make it clearer. In our system, we use tools without a tool changer, just by picking them up with the robot in different orientations. Using subframes, we can easily set the angle and the offset like that. At the same time, when we don't use multiple orientations, when we only grasp within the same orientation all the time, it is sort of overkill and it's easier to set the frame in the UIDH. But this makes a good example anyway, and it's a cool tool, so enjoy. The third method I mentioned, high-level planning, or multi-level planning is an approach that hardly anyone at the World Robot Summit used in 2018. And I doubt that will change much at the next competition. As I said, I think the main issues are performance and user interface, but also reliability. But we're making great progress on all of those points. Moveit uses the Moveit task constructor to assemble these multi-level plans using stages and containers, as you see on the right. To get the details on this, you should look at Robert's slides from the last Move It workshop in Macau or the Roscon introduction talk, which was great. And instead of explaining MPC again, I will show an example of what you can do with it instead. We try to plan placing and fastening the motor plate, the object in the top left, in Move It Task Constructor. That's one subtask of the whole assembly that is graded in the competition, and it's kind of complex. On the right, you see the structure of the whole task. This task consists of multiple containers or stages. The color of each of the blocks tells you which robot is moving inside of it. On the top left, you see which grass poses are evaluated around the object in each of the pick containers. And you see the fallback container, which means that the lines are attempted in order. In this case here, the pick on the left is attempted first because it's simpler, and then if this fails, the pick and regrasp with the other robot is attempted. In the serial container on the right, this line just goes through. You see the right robot picking up the plate and handing it over to the left robot, because otherwise the left robot wouldn't be able to reach the place pose afterwards. Then the right robot picks the tool, then picks a screw, and then it fastens the plate. And then the left robot retreats, and the right robot does it again and puts the plate back. This is super convenient for programming because you barely need to rewrite anything. The system will just calculate the trajectories that fit. But the calculation takes so long, in this case over two minutes, and it can take even longer sometimes. So at the moment, there's sort of a difficult trade-off between 
comfort and performance, but we're working on this. Lastly, I definitely need to mention robustness, which is extremely important for the assembly task. There's always unavoidable noise in the system, in all of the components actually. And those small errors, they often lead to failures, like parts getting stuck or slightly missed grasps. And dealing with this uncertainty is a big challenge in the whole task. And while often cameras are used for this detection, we've had so many calibration issues and so many little problems that we wanted something simpler. Even though we just heard a great talk about movie calibration and how easy it makes everything, but at the time we didn't have that. So instead of using a calibrated camera with all of the potential calibration errors, we touch the environment with the object to determine its position as necessary. Every time we perform one of these touch actions, we just bump into the environment, we gain knowledge about the object position. In our paper, we show that this method can determine the pose to submillimeter precision, and it works in ROS as described on this slide. We're going to present more methods like this for high precision pose estimation with low precision sensors. So stay tuned for that, it's going to be good. So to summarize, Robustness is extremely important for the assembly task, and the in-hand pose estimation that we present in here can help you achieve that. We also saw that MoveIt supports writing industrial assembly routines, and it's on their way to higher level planning that works in the real world. If this is exciting to you, and you want to be a part of it, then come to our Discord and join the community. There are special first-timer issues on GitHub now. We made them specifically for the newcomers. Everyone is welcome. We hope to see you there. It's a great time. It's a great crowd. We'd love to see you. Thanks for listening.